Well, good day there, everybody. This is Joe, and we're out in the garage workshop, and yeah, it's a mess. You will see in a minute here. Uh, a few months ago, I was at a thrift store in Albuquerque, and I picked up an old Sony cassette recorder. It is a Sony TC-18. This is the bottom of the machine, and I think I the sticker on it was $9. I might have paid less for that. I think it was on sale. The TC-18 was a cassette tape recorder that came out in the 1960s. And it's called a tape quarter, TC tape quarter. And what's interesting about it is look at this label. Yeah, distributed by Superscope. So this is back in the day when Sony didn't have their own distribution company in the United States. They were using Superscope as their distribution for these audio products. And I think that's pretty cool. So this is an old, early Sony cassette recorder. Back in the 1980s, I worked at... Uh, Ed's TV and Sight and Sound Lab here in Albuquerque. And we had shelves full of old service manuals for this kind of stuff, these early Sony audio products and TV products and stuff. And we probably had the manual for this, and I wish I had had the manual. But anyways, it wasn't working, and I had to figure out what's going on with it. Let's take a look. When I took it apart, I found the belt, the main drive belt, was just this deteriorated little gummy stuff stuck to the belt groove of the uh, flywheel. And it was just all disintegrated into little chunks. As you can see here, these little pieces of drive belt was all that was left of the main belt. And so, uh, I had to figure out an alternative belt situation. And so, first of all, this plate right here has three screws holding it and you have to take that off in order to get underneath it to remove or install a belt and uh, took off these two screws but this guy right here would not come off I ended up having to drill out this screw head it was just frozen up and they had put some rubber cement in that screw they didn't want it to be removed but I initially had some rubber bands. I had a bunch of these rubber bands here, and I, I just tried sticking a rubber band onto here, and it the unit played, but it played kind of slow. And then, with a small pair of scissors, I tried to cut a rubber band the same size in half, widthwise it was narrower and would have less tension. That didn't work out so well. And then I remembered I had this container of belts from back when I was a TV and VCR repairman. These are old VCR belts from probably the 1980s and 90s, and I found this um, Sylvania, the North American Phillips was the brand back in the uh, late 80s. Uh, I found a drive belt, this belt right here, that seems to work okay with it. Uh, I put some alcohol on the motor bearings, followed it up with a little bit of uh, Triflow lubricant for the bearings, and I also did the same thing on the flywheel here. Clean the heads and the capstan motor. Okay, so my friend Mitch, he supplied a 3 kilohertz test tone recorded off one of his decks. And I'm going to use that as a reference to see how the speed of this machine is. Now I have a 3.5 millimeter output connected out of the monitor output, so that means it's, we're not going to be able to hear the tones. It's going to be uh, uh, like a speaker output kind of a setup here. And uh, I'm going to just set this here. And then uh, I have that connected via some clip leads to my Fluke 29 that has a frequency counter. And uh, let's just see what that uh, speed is, roughly. And it looks like it's about 2.95 kilohertz. Uh, so it's running just a little bit slow, but I think it's pretty much listenable. 2.94 to 2.95. Now earlier when I did this test initially it was really running about 2.94. There's no speed adjustment on the motor. Some of these motors had little potentiometer on the back side of the motor you could adjust the speed with, but this one doesn't have it. But I did notice that it has a um, two mounting flanges here, one here and one down in here. And there's a little bit of play in the slot of that screw. And so what I did is I loosened both of these screws and I moved the motor a little bit closer to the flywheel so the belt wasn't quite, uh, had as much tension. And that seems to have sped it up to 2.95 on the meter instead of 2.94. This belt, even though it works, it's probably not the right tension, the right size. And from what I can tell of the residue from the original 
belt, the original belt looks like it was a round cross-section belt, whereas I'm using a square cross-section right here. And measuring this belt, it's roughly 10 and 3 quarter inches circumference. But I think uh, at the point right here, this machine is pretty much playable. I just got to put it back together and do a little more cleaning on it. And as far as adjustments, uh, there is a coil right here and a little potentiometer on the circuit board. And I think these are for the record oscillator, uh, bias oscillator and the and the bias level. And I'm not going to mess with those. The only thing else in the circuit board is this uh, long skinny switch in there. That is the record play switch that switches the circuits between the record and the play mode and those are always problematic so I cleaned that with some electronic circuit cleaner. Before I put this back together I did want to show you that the battery compartment, it takes four C-cell batteries. The battery compartment does have some corrosion on the battery terminals here so I'm definitely going to be uh, cleaning those off and getting those back into better shape. The spring terminals on the other side actually look pretty good. This four of the four, I think this one's a little bit rusty, but I'm going to just try to do some deoxidation and uh, clean those battery contacts up and so it'll run on DC power as well as AC power. Okay, a little bit of alcohol on the swab. And uh, a lot of this, what looks like corrosion and rust actually comes off these terminals and actually they're cleaning up quite nicely. Well, all right, so that's sufficiently cleaned up there, and this case is cleaned up here. So let's try to fit it all back together. And put the screws into it. So there are two self-tapping screws. One is a pan head, one is a flat head. And then the rest of these screws are machine screws. So you gotta know where the screws go. Okay, so the two self-tapping screws, the flathead screw goes here in the handle, and this pan head goes down in the corner of the battery compartment. And then the other four screws here are the, uh, the machine screws. This clear little disc and the volume control. Well, I've got some C cell batteries. I actually had to take these out of my brother EP43 typewriter. What's cool about this tape player is they have this little plastic uh, band here that helps you remove the batteries when. See how that works. Some of this Japanese jazz, just a brief play of it. Battery powered. I actually like the way they designed this unit to be placed on its bottom right here. And you can see the way the logo is face up and the, uh, all the writing and the controls are on the top here. So it kind of sits upright. It, you know, it has the basic form factor of a so-called shoebox recorder, but it really does uh, sit upright like this with a handle enabling you to grab it. It's kind of an interesting form factor. I really like it. And the eject uh, also pops up the tape for you to reach it. Now, overall, the condition of this machine, you know, was really surprisingly good considering its age. This thing, uh, I haven't really traced it back in terms of the serial number, but I think these were in the late 1960s. That's pretty early for Sony uh, cassette tape recorders, and especially having one like this that it appears to be in such good shape. Cleaning up, lubricating, cleaning the, the tape path, the pinch roller cap stand, record play heads, and of course replacing that belt, getting the motor lubricated, and the speed closer to normal, yes, it's still a little bit slow, but not, not nearly as bad as it was. Clean and lube the record play switch, volume control. And uh, so on the back here, it has a uh, monitor output, so you can basically directly drive an external speaker. There is, there's an auxiliary line input for uh, audio recording, and then there's a microphone input with a remote start-stop jack. 
And uh, that's pretty cool. So the speaker is in the front here. It's an oval speaker. And there's a little bit of ventilation with some foam as a uh, kind of a vent uh, dust filter. And I think that gives a little bit of resonance out the back of the cabinet also. It's surprisingly good audio considering the size of it. It's really good sound to it. I'm surprised. And an AC input right here. Yeah, overall I'm really pleased with it actually. It came out better than I thought it would. And I haven't really decided on whether I want to take off the price tag stickers or not, but for now I'm going to leave them on there just to remind myself that it, yes, it came from a thrift store. Distributed by Superscope. Well, I'm going to do a test recording. I have a uh, Maxell tape. All right, we're going to pop this into the three and a half millimeter jack. Okay, testing, testing, testing. Plus 10 decibels on the TacStar microphone. Plus 10 decibels on the TacStar microphone. Testing, one, two, three, three, two, one. Joe out. Plus 10 decibels on the TacStar microphone. Testing, one, two, three, three, two, one. Joe out. Well, apparently it likes a hot microphone. Yeah, if you get a hot mic with enough amplification, it looks like it works good. That's pretty exciting, actually. Now, as far as some of the marks on the cabinet here, the left and right side and down near the bottom, I noticed uh, on the bottom there's a little bit of red-colored residue. There's actually kind of like a melted line melted into it with this red residue, and I think it's candle wax. And I, uh, there's a little bit of, like this corner here is a little melted and there's a little red material fused onto the plastic. So I did take some WD-40 and that's always good for cleaning plastic surfaces, surprisingly. Take a paper towel, some WD-40 and uh, rub it into it and then uh, take some Armorall and finish it up with Armorall. You can also use a little bit of isopropyl alcohol, helps also, but WD-40 and Armorall is actually pretty good for these plastic surfaces, and I did do a little cleaning on that with those two materials, and it did clean it up quite a bit better than it was, but again, I think the final residue is from melted candle wax that got on here. And, you know, you think about the late 1960s, maybe 1970s, candles, macrame, uh, hippies? Who knows what kind of music? My gosh, it could have been heathen music played on this recorder. It's probably actually pretty good music played on this recorder. You can just imagine, right? Anyways, wonder what kind of history this thing had. We have the TC-18 here, and I have this Panasonic RQ-2102 recorder. It's a pretty modern, decent recorder with good speeds. And so let's go ahead and take our test recording that we just did and uh, pop it in here and uh, all right this is joe in the garage recording video coffee slope and audio the sony tc18 tape quarter 18. i'll have to compare this playback into another tape recorder see how it sounds all right that's it joe out bye well that's actually pretty decent. I'm surprised. With a hot enough microphone signal like this attack star turned up to plus 10 decibels. As I said earlier, I really do like the ergonomics of the way this thing sits uh, on its base. The batteries are in the bottom, so it's a uh, low center of gravity. And uh, it's designed just to sit there, take up a small footprint. And I kind of like the way the speaker is on the bottom, so it kind of has this effect of bouncing the sound off the tabletop a little bit. Well, I do have another microphone. This is a uh, Shure Lenshopper VP83, and it has a plus 20 decibel setting. And so uh, I'm going to pop on this external extension cable, hook this up to the uh, mic jack in the back, right? And um, Get our Maxell tape, side A. Here we go. Okay, testing, testing. This is Joe recording using the Shure Lenshopper VP83 in the plus 20 decibel mode. Joe out. All right, let's do a little rewind. 
Okay, testing, testing. This is Bill recording using the Shure Lens Hopper VP83 and the plus 20 decibel mode. Recording into the Sony TC18, tape quarter 18, tape recorder. It certainly likes a hot microphone, that's for sure. That's pretty cool. When I had found this machine, I had written an email to my friend Mitch and I asked him, did you want this machine? Because I know Mitch has been experienced in re repairing tape recorders for a long time and I thought he might be interested in it. He said, no, why don't you save it and you're for yourself and try to fix it up yourself and see what you can do with it. Well, I'm glad I did. And uh, just this Saturday, I got a internet care package from Mitch, including a letter and a couple tapes for our tape recorder correspondence and a micro cassette tape as well. We do both compact and micro cassettes. So I got some tapes, newly repaired tape recorder. I'm thinking I'm gonna be using this for my reply to Mitch's letter. Well, there's a final little story that I have to tell you about this recorder. When I walked into the thrift store, um, I immediately went over to the aisles where I knew there was this kind of stuff. And uh, I saw this guy this dad with a really young kid, and he was kind of eyeing this recorder. He kind of was looking at it, and then he put it back on the shelf, and he went walking around, and I immediately went over to this. This was the only recorder in the whole place, the only one I had seen in weeks of revisiting, and I immediately recognized the, right, the, the Sony. I recognized the age of it, and I thought, wow, I don't know if this thing works, but man, I'd love to get it, and so I was kind of hemming and hawing about it, deciding if I wanted to get it. In the meantime, I had walked away, and then the guy came over again and was really seriously eyeing this. I was afraid he was going to pick it up. You know, I was being a little selfish, but realistically, right, given the fact that it did need to be repaired, it's interesting that uh, I'm glad I got it for two reasons. Number one, I am selfish, and I wanted the recorder, but also I was able to fix it and get it at least into a working condition, and uh, I'm happy about that. This is Joe with another video in the Tape Project series. You guys, have a great day. Stay creative. Bye-bye.